the three turnings. Um, this is a model that was developed kind of later on in the in the in the evolution of the Buddhist tradition. Uh, it was developed um, by what's called the Yogacara school, and then further refined to an extreme degree by the Tibetans, um, who I think probably were just generating all these practices and you know, they had the whole history of the Buddhist tradition up to that point. And they, I imagine they were just sitting there with all these things like, how do we make sense of all this? You know, and so looking at it in terms of these three turnings of the wheel, these three kind of epochal um, developments, you could say, or these three shifts in the sort of um, the ideals of the tradition, what they're aiming for, the core teachings, the core practices. Um, um, these are, this model is really, uh, it's really, I found helpful in understanding the broader kind of uh, wisdom tradition as a whole. And also it's interesting to look at it as a kind of evolutionary um, process. And so I wanna talk just a bit about each of these turnings, just a kind of brief overview. Um, and you know, the word turning is interesting, the turning of the wheel. Um, this is kind of related to the imagery of this sort of eight-spoked wheel of Dharma. The noble eightfold path is often represented by this wheel. And the turning of the wheel uh, represents the teaching uh, um, of the Buddha uh, and, uh, and kind of putting this, these teachings out there, putting these memes out there, putting these practices out there, and then um, have, becoming to have a life of their own. Um, the first turning happened after the Buddha's awakening, after the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, woke up under a tree. He was sitting there, woke up, and for a while, according to legend, um, wasn't sure what to do with that and wasn't sure if anyone would be able to understand what he had experienced. He genuinely wasn't sure if he could teach this or share this with anyone, if they would get it. Uh, but eventually he decided that he thought maybe some people could. Uh, some people out there in the world, he he determined with his psychic powers, had very little dust in their eyes, very little, uh, very little obscuring their vision. And, and those people he thought he could, he could share this profound truth with. Um, and so he uh, ended up walking back to meet some of his old buddies, his old compatriots, uh, who he used to practice with, doing these intense aesthetic practices. And he taught them in this deer park um, in Saranath, outside of Var in Varanasi, India. He taught them um, the Four Noble Truths. This was the first teaching uh, in Buddhism. Um, so the truth of suffering, you know, that suffering is a real thing <laughs> um, and that as human beings, we, we, we can't avoid it actually. Uh, and the cause of that existential suffering, um, which was described as uh, tanha, as craving or as thirst, as this constant sense of wanting something different uh, other than what is. Uh, and that the third truth was that there is actually freedom. There is a freedom from that kind of existential uh, craving, wanting things to be different. Uh, and then the fourth noble truth had to do with the path to the, how you actually get there. What, what is the path that led him to that freedom? And what is the path that could help others do the same? Um, the noble eightfold path or the, or in the compressed version it's the three trainings ethics, meditation, and wisdom together. And one of the core teachings of the first turning, one of the things that was emphasized uh, is what's called the three characteristics uh, of experience. You know, pointing out that when we notice sensations uh, closely, we see that they change. Um, we see this suffering that's described in the, in the, in the noble trees. We see this kind of constant existential kind of gripping or holding, or clinging, uh, or just tuning out or pushing away, like these fundamental movements uh, of experience in which there is a lack of okayness. There's a res some amount of resistance to what is. Uh, and then, of course, seeing this changing, flowing, fluxing, grasping, releasing experience, uh, if we really pay attention moment to moment, we notice, and then we notice that there is no solid reference point to which all of that refers back to there's only changing sensation and thoughts and images and body sensations and emotions and feelings and whatever we can categorize, whatever words we use, there's nothing that stays the same long enough to refer back to or to call appropriately call a self, 
Uh, so this is the, the, the third characteristic of non-self. And the, the, uh, the ideal in this first turning is what's called the ideal of the arhat. The arhat is the perfectly enlightened person, the one who has gotten off of the wheel of samsara, who's ended their constant cyclical ex ex rebirth after rebirth. It's like Groundhog Day, over and over, the same damn thing. Um, you know, there's a way in which in, in that kind of metaphysics, in the Indian metaphysics, that was like hell. You know, you don't want to be constantly having to do the same thing over and over again. And of course, it's suffering. Um, so this whole idea of waking up out of samsara and discovering this freedom that goes beyond form, beyond uh, sensation, uh, is its own kind of special category of experience, but not an experience itself, nirvana. Um, this was the goal of the arhat to completely liberate oneself from constant cyclical birth and death, to become free of birth and death. And the practices that emerged in this first turning, most notably, are the practices of vipassana, of clear seeing, of moment to moment awareness, uh, of shamatha or concentration or samadhi practice of developing an extraordinarily fine-tuned attention that becomes more and more subtle, more and more spacious, more and more formless in its characteristics. Um, moving through progressively what in the early tradition and in the pre-Buddhist uh, tradition, the in, in the uh, Indian tradition were called the jhanas, uh, the absorptions. And then the last set of practices that developed here were called the Brahma Viharas, um, the divine abodes, the sublime attitudes, the place where the gods hang and chill. Um, you know, this is the place where um, we're developing qualities of heart and mind like kindness, like caring for each other, um, like compassion, feeling. Uh, the suffering of another and actually wanting to alleviate it, feeling a desire to alleviate someone else's freedom, uh, of sympathetic joy, of, of really taking joy in the happiness of others instead of feeling like your happiness is taking away from my happiness because there's only so much to go around. Um, and, and then finally, and this is really important in the first turning, a key value is equanimity uh, of the steadiness of heart of being able to kind of be with the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs, the crises and the breakthroughs and the reformations of life, um, to be able to be with that in a way where our heart is not knocked around so much. So these are some of the kind of core practices that emerged in the first turning, and they're still really relevant. Um, they're still extraordinarily uh, relevant and many people are continue to practice these first turning teachings at some point uh, around 2 CE so several hundred years after the historical Buddha um, the Buddha reappears uh, of course not in physical space but in some sort of Buddha space uh, and um, appears to teach again and to turn the wheel again and the idea here you know in buddhism we always blame the buddha for for new things uh that's what makes it a continuous tradition in a way um but here the buddha wasn't necessarily saying this is um this is a superior new teaching um although you could say that that's historically true um, rather the the story was there are people of different capacities some people like need the first turning stuff. They need the gradual stuff. They need all this preparatory stuff because, you know, it's a little harder for them to get it. But then some people are really close already to getting it. And all, all you really need to do is just kind of give them a little push uh, just to point out where, 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 where they're holding and then they might, you know, get it. Um, and so this teaching was in a way for those with greater capacity, um, um, which is, I think, a historical way of saying these are the better teachings. <laughs> but regardless, that's not how the tradition understands itself. And these teachings, the second turning, uh, was said to have taken place at Vulture Peak in uh, Raja Griha in Bihar, India. Uh, and here, um, the ideal is no longer the arhat, um, the one who's discovering liberation for themselves, but rather is the ideal of the bodhisattva, the being who wishes to awaken for the benefit of all beings, to help 
all beings awaken. Uh, and I think what's important here to mention is that the core teachings in the second turning also change. Um, Nagarjuna uh, was a second century philosopher, uh, Buddhist monk, um, and mythical figure. We don't actually know a lot about this person historically. Um, and, and, and part of what Nagarjuna did was to kind of point to this very radical emptiness of kind of cutting through all conceptions of what emptiness is. Because the early Buddhists, they had like, a, like reams and reams and reams and reams of pages describing all these different sensations and how they all interacted and how they all interrelated. This is what's called the Abhidhamma. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the second turning comes around and goes, no, 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 no. Like y'all have become way too obsessed with ideas and all of these, all these concepts, all these lists, all these categories, all of this stuff, it's actually empty. It's empty. We've got to see beyond these conceptions. Um, and here emptiness also, it, it's, it has a different meaning than the earlier first turning focus on non-self. It's actually, it's related, but it's not the same because there's a philosophical shift in the second turning in which emptiness is reconceived of not as there being no central reference point in experience, nothing that's stable or solid, but rather emptiness is understood better as there being no independently existing self. That is the understanding of ourselves. We actually do have a conventional self. Um, we do have a personality. We do know when someone says our name, who they're referring to. We do have this continuous story, this continuous experience, these memories that kind of make sense in a kind of linear fashion. Um, so it's not denying that, this, this truth of emptiness. Rather, it's pointing out that this self arises with other selves and with the environment, that, that the environment and each other enables us to be. You know, without air, without food, without water, we're dead. Without each other, we're dead. Um, you know, without uh, the ability to um, make sense uh, of ourselves with each other, you know, we quickly lose, you know, people when they're isolated for long periods of time, unless they're con incredibly gifted contemplatives, um, you know, they start to lose their mind, actually. Um, and so here the understanding is that the self is contingent with reality. It arises with everything else. It's all interwoven with itself. It's all interconnected, interdependently arising. So that's the understanding of emptiness. And with that, there is also the understanding of compassion, emptiness and compassion, wisdom and compassion in the Mahayana second turning become equally important. Whereas in the first turning, emptiness uh, or nirvana was considered the ultimate goal. And there's the relative and the ultimate. And the ultimate is the most important thing. You have to wake up out of the relative and into the ultimate. But here, it's actually a, a, a different point, which is that the ultimate and relative are not actually fundamentally separate, are not different from one another. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form, says the Heart Sutra. Um, here, this is a description of what we could call radical non-duality. You know, that everything that arises, this form of life, this experience, is inherently interconnectedly empty. Um, and, and by recognizing that, we don't have to negate it. We just recognize the truth of that and recognize and see, oh, like these thoughts about things are approximations of what hap is what's happening. And our mind, you know, that's how it works. Like it makes things into things. It makes processes into things. It makes relationships into you know, self and other. Um, that's what the mind does. It's how it seems to function, at least, you know, uh, certain levels of development. Um, and so this is a very different teaching. Uh, the teaching really is on non-duality, on uh, interdependence. And you see practices emerging in the second turning, like Tonglen, you know, exchanging self and other. Uh, compassion practices that go completely against our normal you know, intuition about what to do, you know, like, let me pull in all the suffering of the world and give all my good stuff away. Um, you know, it's a complete reversal of our normal tendency. Uh, you see the development of practices in the Chan and Zen school, like silent illumination, 
uh, of shikantaza, just sitting, these formless awareness practices that are deeply rooted in the body and in the posture and in being um, that emerge, that are more directly pointing to uh, enlightenment as not something you have to get to through all of these different states and stages, but rather enlightenment uh, is your very, uh, it's, it's accessible right now and just sitting is enlightenment. Just being is being awake. There's nothing else that you have to do or achieve or acquire, um, actually. And then a few hundred years later begins the emergence of what's later called the third turning, um, which gets really incubated, uh, especially in the high plateaus of Tibet, um, as Buddhism is kind of wiped out in India. Uh, and also it goes, kind of goes into Japan and appears in the, what's called the Shingon tradition. And, and, and here the ideal of the third turning, it's, it's uh, even, even more kind of extreme. It's saying not, not just the arhat, not the one that's awake, not the bodhisattva, the one who's on this path of waking up and helping everyone else wake up, but actually the, the ideal here is the Buddha himself, to be a Buddha, uh, to be fully awake in this life. And there's all of these sort of techniques and approaches in the third turning, which are about realizing your Buddhahood now um, and using whatever means skillful means are necessary in order to do so and so you see the emergence of things like tantra you know the hindu tantric tradition merging with buddhism and you see all of these transgressive practices you know where people are suddenly eating meat ceremonially and having sex and doing all kinds of mind-altering substances and they're you know doing this in a way because the view has changed um, such that now we see that there's no em separation between emptiness and form, then that means that every bit of experience, every form that's arising is actually uh, a doorway into emptiness, into our awakened nature, into our Buddha nature. Um, and this is an important kind of idea in the third turning that our nature is already awake that this isn't something we need to, again, do anything to gain, but it's actually who we already are. It's our birthright. And so Chagyam Trungpa called this basic goodness, but it's not goodness compared to evil. It's not like good and evil. It's like, it's the basic goodness of this. You know, this is happening, thus it's basically good. Um, and you also get the teachings on what are called the emptiness of emptiness in the third turning, which is probably a correction uh, or corrective on the sort of emphasis in the second turning on emptiness. Because, you know, every time we emphasize something, it seems like as human beings or get obsessed with something, we end up kind of fetishizing it. We give it a lot of importance. And then, you know, we get attached. <laughs> uh, and we think, oh, we've got the holy, awesome teaching. You know, we've got the, we've got the best realization. And here in the third turning, they say, no, even emptiness, you know, this, this whole thing of emptiness, that's empty too. We have to let go of emptiness as well. And, and, and really here, I think the emphasis becomes fullness. It's this full emptiness, this empty fullness, this effulgence of life, this constant coming forth and being born uh, is... Um, is part of the beautiful play and dance of, of this reality and delusion and awakening come together. You know, there's no awakening without delusion. There's no delusion without awakening. Um, we don't even have to worry about awakening versus delusion. Like this is all part of the play. Um, and you also see the development in Tibet of the, the Mahamudra and Dzogchen traditions, these um, incredibly uh, interesting approaches to developing Buddhahood right here, right now, developing your awake nature, having it pointed out, using that as the ground, walking the path, but never forgetting your true nature. And then eventually realizing, you know, for yourself in a full and deep and complete way. Oh yeah, this is true. There's nothing I have to do to be awake. There's no requirements. Um, this is my nature. Uh, and it's okay to forget um, because delusion is part of the game. 